Hello everybody, welcome to my videos, my name is Jamie Bonds Games, today we do an unboxing video. Okay, unboxing video, and I'll be absolutely honest with you, I don't know anything about the Atari 400, never played one before, and never actually seen one. But anyway, as soon as I found out there was actually a pre-order, I pre-ordered it on the 11th of January 2024, bought on Amazon, I believe it was an Amazon exclusive, £99.99 I paid for it, and arrived a week ago. So today we're going to do an unboxing and a review video. Now the main focusing point on this channel is Commodore. I love the Mega and I love the C64, and having original hardware is of course my main focusing point. But when it comes to mini systems, I've got all of them in my collection, all the ones I'm aware of anyway. Some I've done unboxings and some I have not, some I've just bought over the years. So when it comes to a system I've never played before, of course I jumped to a platoon C. But anyway, we open it up today, we'll try all the games out and see what it can do, and I'll give you my final four at the end. Right, knife check. And there we go, as always, the condition of the box, the quality of the box is amazing. The A400 Mini, 25 games built in, and of course this one has a joystick. Now some Minis had two joysticks, some had one joystick, some had two control pads, and some had one. But I proved of having a joystick, and hopefully this can be a good one. Of course, these Minis, some have good controllers and joysticks, and some have not. And I totally utterly forgot, but yes, of course, this one you can load your own games via a USB. And of course, some Minis you can, and some Minis you cannot. 25 classic Atari 8 bit games included, which is not bad, not bad at all, but of course, an adding your own is a bonus, isn't it? So, maybe we'll do some close ups. The Atari 8 bit family is a series of 8 bit home computers introduced by Atari Incorporated in 1979 with Atari 400 and Atari 800. As the first home computer architecture with co-processors, it has graphics and sound more advanced than most of its contemporaries. So there we go, 1979, Born was born in 1982. The first gaming system we got was 1987 was the CG4, which of course I still got. I love the CG4, and I love the Vega as well. Basically, I'm a cool little man. We're going to find out a lot about this today, so open it up, set it up, and see what we can do. Once again, attention to detail on these minis is absolutely superb. On the front, we've got four controller jacks, so of course, if you have four joysticks, you've got potential of four player. On the back, we've got the switch, one USB C, one HDMI, and one USB. There you go. And of course, the box comes with your cables, you have one HDMI and one USB C. We've got so many of these cables now. And there is the joystick, only one in the box. It looks amazing, does it perform in the long run, we'll find out soon enough, but hopefully it doesn't snap. But when it comes to retro games, just their mini systems are absolutely perfect. The same cannot be said about their joysticks. The C4 mini joystick was absolutely diabolical. They broke all the time. I saw so many posts on Facebook, they always snapped. And very quickly too. The C4 Maxi joystick was a slight improvement, but again, they always broke. But yes, the fix was easier, but still not great quality. Now bear in mind, I'm not a fan of control pads, they redeem themselves, because even I like this one. The A500 mini pad was great, I praise it a lot in my review video, but I still would have preferred a joystick. But, the mouse was very well made, that was fantastic, well, two of those, that worked brilliantly. But yes, what I really wanted was a joystick like this. This is the ultimate, this classic zipstick, so please make joysticks like this, that's not going to be broken. Now you can buy more of these from Amazon, they're available for pre-order, available on the 26th of April 2024, and they're £24.99 each, so yes, you can go to a maximum of four. If you want to do that, you'd be spending £74.97, with quite a lot of money, but for me, one is enough. But hopefully, it won't break. But anyway, we're going to play some games now. There we 
we go, looks absolutely fantastic, and we have music playing at the same time. Now, on the joystick, now round this circular bit of the stick itself is actually a directional pad, so that's actually buttons. So that allows you to get around the menu. You've got a button there, and on the back, you've got two buttons there, and one in the corner. So all going to have their own purpose. So let's see what we can do. So the menu button is going to be that one. Okay, display options. You press the top button to go back and the F button to go forward. So we've got the 4x3, the pixel perfect, enable CRT effect and choose frame. So, me being me, I'm going to go for the basics, but it's nice to give you a few sets of options. But we'll go for that one. So you press F and you press T to close. Close again. Language will be done. Advanced options. System options. You can set the level of your music, which is nice. Uh, back. System information. Shut down. Legal notices and factory set. That's all fine. I have to admit, I was surprised it's only 25, I expect it to be more than that, but then you can add your own games. But just to name a few, we've got Airball, we've got Asteroid, we've got Battlezone, Bristles, Capture the Flag, Crystal Castles, Flip and Flop, Henry's House, which I'm definitely looking forward to playing, Lee is basically Bruce Lee, only version of play is the CC4, Missile Command, Star Raiders 2, and you Anyway, we'll pick one at random, we'll go for Classic Asteroid, shall we? So pressing up on the joystick gives you the controls for that game you're about to play. Activate defences, select mode, fire, turn, and asteroid speed, fast, slow. Right. Right, there we go. Asteroids. Copyright 1981 by Atari. Okay, classic asteroids. Can I go on with that? However, though, it took me about five minutes to realise how you actually start your game. Now, the area around the joystick itself is called the CX stick, which has four additional buttons. You can use that to manoeuvre yourself around the carousel or add additional options to your game. But to start this game, you press the right directional button on your CX stick. Press it once to start your game, press it again to restart your game. There are two buttons at the top of the joystick. The top left is your menu button, the top right is your home button. Press them both down at the same time, brings up your virtual keyboard. And the button in the corner is your S button. Now also, if you press the home button and the S button and the left button down at the same time, you can actually rewind up to 30 seconds of your game. If that is your sort of thing, of course. But anyway, it's a good game. Of course, I haven't played many Asteroid games, but it's a nice version. Well, there we go. Start the game off with four lives, clear them all, and you move on to the next level. Okay, game well so far. I think it's still four. You do start the game off with four lives, and you do earn some lives any time you reach 10,000 points. Which, of course, we're quite close to. But it's absolute carnage at the moment of time, which you expect the more you invest in this game. Of course, you use the thrust, you use the shield, you don't earn any more additional weapons. But the joystick is performing okay. It's taking us to get used to. It's not the most comfortable joystick, but I'm sure I get used to it the more I use it. But of course, there's so much built into this one joystick. The original 400 and 800 is something one button. Not here. There's so much built into it. There is a different life. You go from 4 to 5. Finish this level and move on to the next game. What a nice game. Sounds like Jaws, doesn't it? One more mains. There you go, fantastic, that's Asteroids. There we go, high score, 20,630. Right, now to exit your game, you press the top right button. So there we go, you go back to the main menu, and like the C4 Mini and the A500 Mini, the image appears at the top right, you can resume play from there if you wish to, or move on to something else. There you go, a little bit of basketball, why not? Atari Edition, copyright 1979. Okay, a little bit of basketball, why not? I don't fully understand the rules of the game, but I'm okay with this game. Of course, if you score inside the box, you get two points. I'm not sure what the technical term is, but inside the box, you get two points. Outside the box, you get three points. But on this game, anywhere on the court, if it goes through the hoop, you get a maximum of two points. But the joystick is very sensitive. But anyway, we've got to try and hold the fire button down for the longest period of time, the right amount of time, to make the jump. But yeah, we're trying to steal the ball off of them. But anyway, I am the home team, coming at 4, visitor's computer, coming at 6. We'll go to 10, shall we? Steal the ball off him, and put it in the hoop. But yeah, I haven't played many basketball games. Played a bit at school as well, but never really sort of fully understood the rules. Well, a nice game once again, but choose from 5 variations and up to 4 players. Start each game with a jump shot, and don't triple pass the end line. And there's another one. There we go, brilliant, basketball. What a steal! Just taking the lead. Not much time remains, but yes, you can lose the ball very easily, but also can get it back quite easy as well. Currently, 40 to 38. 
Well, if it's crashed, it's paused, but it's the furthest it goes. So anyway, 50 all was a good opening quarter, but that's more than enough footage. That is basketball. There we go, why not? Bombabash, First Star Software Incorporated, copyright 1984. Okay, so the game is Bombabash, a 2D maze puzzle video game released in 94 by First Star Software. With Atari 8 bit computers. It was created by Canadian developers Peter Lieber and Chris Gray. The player controls Rockford and must collect treasure while avoiding distant hazards. Old Dash was ported to many 8 bit and 16 bit systems and turned into a coin operated arcade game and was followed by multiple sequels and re releases and influenced games such as Repton and Drip clones such as Emerald Mines. And you cannot go wrong with a game like this. I have to admit though, I didn't play many Bold Dash games back in the day. In fact, the first game I played was actually a clone of. Bordash, which was on the seat floor, called Saracen. I haven't played that for absolutely years. But the rules are simple. Go try and find all the diamonds and find it to the door. Do it in the safest school way possible. Don't be crushed by the boulders. Because you can make a path through the earth by basically moving forward. And also, you can push the casual rock if you have to. And sometimes you have to to make the path exit a nice, safe and secure one. Get to the door and rock. But again, another great game. Okay, we turn back to the main menu, and of course, you can give it a rating from one to four stars. In the meantime, we'll go for Yump. There we go, Yump. Never played it before, but I have played Yump 64 on the CG4. And unlike the music, I had no idea this system could sound like this. This is amazing. Right, game controls. I do wonder if you can plug in a keyboard for this. Left, right, shift, Z, X, plus, and... I reckon you can. I reckon you can. We'll try and find a keyboard. There you go. Keyboard confirmed. Which is why there's a spare USB at the back. Okay, so the game is Yump. This unique rhythm based platform you guide a bouncing ball to the beat through a mesmerizing assortment of suspended platforms. The game contains 21 levels. It looks really, really good. I had no idea the Type 400 was capable of a game like this. It looks good, it plays well, and it sounds amazing. Of course, have played it on the CD4. It's great on that one as well, but I haven't finished it before. But of course, yes, 21 levels is what the scene is doing. But of course, as soon as you give it you expect nothing more, nothing less. But I don't recall the CD4 version has a bar at the bottom of the screen. It tells you how far you are through each of the tunnels. Now, each of the tunnels, you have a limited amount of jumps. You don't have to use them. It helps if you do, but it helps if you don't. Because anyone you have remaining in each and in the tunnel is equal to points. Start the game off with five lives. That's very generous. Once again, there you go. Finish level one, five lives remaining. Bonus points, 500. Okay, level two, and like the evil version gives you a password at the end of the stage. And some tiles work for you, some work against you. You've got the speed up tile, the slow tile, the booze tile, the one up tile, and the holes. The small, medium, large. The long jump tile, the extra long jump tile, the earthquake tile, which causes a short burst of distracting screen shake. The brighter diagonal tiles, the teleport entry and exit tile, the bridge and incomplete tiles, and the pause and resume tile. And also, you have the lightning tile, which causes a period of intense bright flashing, which after which returns back to normal. And we are very, very close to losing there. There we go. It's fantastic. End of level two. That is good. And just to confirm, yes, you can also use the keyboard if that's your way of doing things. But yes, left and right, working brilliantly. I thought it was to have a high score table. No, it doesn't have one. But it works. There you go. Bristles. Never played it before. Copyright 1983. First Star Software Incorporated. Okay, so the game this is Bristles, a video game by Fernando Herrera for the Sorry Epic Family, published by the company co founded First Star Software in 1983. It was ported to the Commodore 64, the Zex Spectrum, and the XD's Maxiflex arcade system. As Peter the Painter, the player uses ladders and elevators to move through color view of the house to paint all the walls. Which in this case, green is the color here. The enemies are there to hinder you, of course. We can jump and also crouch, but I don't think you can fire back. As long as you get through all levels, paint all the walls the right colour, you move on. And you have a school level from 1 to 5, if more. Okay, the time has come. Henry's house. In this platformer, you control little Henry, who has shrunk to six inches tall, and must carefully navigate through the raw household to find a cure. That's one of my favourite games on the C4. There we go, one of my favourite games on the C4. This is Henry's house. Chris Murray, starring little Henry, of right 987, all right deserved. Okay, so the game is Henry's House, a platform game developed by Chris Murray, the Target Epic Family, and the Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 version was published by English Software in 1984, while the Target Epic Family followed in 1987 by Mastertronic. The game was produced in the UK, was loosely based on the Prince Henry of Wales, who then was a baby. The working title of the game was Home Sweet Home. And it's brilliant. I love it on the CD4. I have finished it on the CD4, but it's difficult. It was difficult on the CD4. It's going to be difficult here as well. 
What makes this game difficult is basically everything kills you, and it's very easy to die in a game like this. For the small distance, like Manic Miner, Jets of Willy, is also easy to kill. We've got to try and find all the items. Level one is the closed cupboard. Gloves, hats, bow ties, money bags, badge buttons, be rich boots, and the question mark. In fact, question mark is the key that puts the key on screen. Find the key, find the door. We start the game off with three lives. But yeah, it's a bit more smoother this version, but then this version was after the C4 version. But yes, you can jump also, but you can't fight back, you can't crouch either. But you've got to try and find all the items. It all helps with your points. I can't remember if you earn digital lives from score, I don't think so. But we finally pick up the question mark, but don't be killed by any enemies, and the key will be put on screen. Just need those boots. But yes, of course, jumping is very important, but yes, even jumping at a distance, it's very easy to get killed by something. So many things can kill you. On this one, the wall can kill you, the crown can kill you, the boots can kill you, and those rotating heads can also kill you. And of course, falling from a height is deadly. It doesn't have to be a big height. Just a small height is enough. Enough to ruin his day. We'll be really, really close to some of the hazards. And move at the right time. And there's not a lot of time in between the movements, really. That was close. We go through the door. We go to level two. Okay, we arrive at room two, this is the bathroom, rubber ducks, nail brushes, soap, plastic scissors, a tap with water drips, teeth sponge, toothpaste, and a bath plug. And like the last one, the question mark is the key. On this one, the key is the bath plug, which is located at the top right corner of the screen. But we've got to try and drain the water from the sink. We do that by picking up the bath plug. But yes, I'm noticing quite a few differences already, but yes, a much, much smoother game. But yes, those teeth in the sequel version did not move up and down, but I do here. But yes, you've got to be absolutely pixel perfect in quite a lot of these levels. In Henry's house, a player guides Henry through the numerous rooms of the house. Each room is filled with deadly household items like toothpaste, and toasters, kettles and coffee makers. Touching any one of these results in the death of Henry. And Form of the Great Two Height has a similar effect. So, we jump over to the top right and pick up the bath plug. Now you can also jump over the teeth. Or go round the teeth, which in the CD4 is easy to do. But on this one, you've got to try and go over it. But very soon, that is going to be replaced by a toothbrush. And you can be killed by a toothbrush. In fact, anything can kill you in a game like this. But I have changed my tactic here. You don't want to be killed by the drip, I just was. But anyway, one life is lost. Bring on the toothbrush. But yes, that does move a lot faster. So I'm not quite sure what the best approach is. I've always gone below the toothbrush. But you've got to get it absolutely perfect here. Like that. That is so tight for time. Don't be killed by the toothpaste. Don't be killed by the sponge. And get checked for sure. But a really, really nice version. Also, it's going to be on the Mega. Or has it been done? I know it's in the works. That's no. But anyway, move on to the three. That's the enemy's house. Next on the list, Berserk. I was one when this game came out. Copyright 1983, Atari. Okay, so the game is Berserk, a multi-directional shooter designed by Ellen McNeil in this arcade in 1980 by Stern Electronics of Chicago. Find Shadow Shadow Fox is one of the first arcade video games with speech synthesis. Berserk places the player in a series of top-down maze-like rooms containing armed robots. Home ports were published to Atari 2600, Atari 5200 and the Victrix. The sequel frenzy was released in 1982. Again, a very, very good game. You don't technically have to kill anyone, but it helps if you do. You get digital bonus if you kill all enemies on screen. But I don't think those bouncing balls can be shot. I have tried shooting them a few times. I've made contact a few times, but I don't think you get to kill them. But what I do like about this game, digital catch is quite slow moving. But it makes it more interesting that also the robots actually shoot themselves. And making contact with the walls kills you, and it also kills them also. Now, the speed of the robots determines what colour they are. Some don't fire at all, but the white ones are the fastest ones I've seen so far. Uh, but it's nice you get a choice of route, go left, right, up or down, is entirely up to you. But we do start the game off with two lives, and then immediately they're killing themselves. It's fantastic, but yes, it's also a two-player game. But you don't be hanging around for too long, because yes, your character's very slow, and of course, the enemy that arrives on the scene arrives after a certain amount of time. And because it takes so long to get from A to B, you're always going to be struggling to get away from him. But I love the speech. I didn't realise that 5400 had speech as good as this. It's really good. There we go. That is bizarre. 
Right, so I'm sending the big guns. And these ones are more difficult. They are slightly faster and they do fire a lot more. They're really much more accurate. And the more you press into the game, there's going to be much, much more of them. But again, they're killing themselves. They're doing it very quickly. They're doing me a favour. That's brilliant. I think yellow are also more difficult than white. But they only appear after a certain quantity of rooms have been reached. Bonus 110. Look at these! You can also shoot their bullets. Look at the bullets here. What a game, this is fantastic. But yes, Wizard of War is another one that springs to mind when I see this game. But yes, they can fire a lot more often. But not only are these going to be quicker, but I'm assuming that big bouncing ball is always going to be difficult. It's going to be faster, isn't it? Here comes trouble. Well, this is on the left, not the right, I'm okay. But there we go, we're on the next game, and berserk. There we go, another game I'm very intrigued to see. Lee, also known as Bruce Lee on the CD4, one of my favourites on the CD4, got it in 1988. Bought it from Sainsbury's. But here we are on the Type 400, Lee it's called, by Ron J. Fortier. Okay, so the game is Bruce Lee, a platform game written by Ron J. Fortier for the Atari 8 family and published in 1984 by Dead Soft. The graphics are done by Kelly Day and the music is done by John A. Fitzpatrick. The player takes the role of Bruce Lee, while the second player can either control the Yamo or alternates with the player one controlling of Bruce Lee. The Composition 4 version and Apple II version was released the same year and the game was converted to ZX Spectrum and Anderson CBC, published by US Gold. It was the first US Gold game released featuring a famous individual. MSX versions were published in 1985 by Cobb Tick. Very, very difficult to read at the same time as playing it. It's a brilliant game though, but yes, big fan of the version, got it in 1988. And of course, it's a bit weird in a way, so many years have passed and I've played it so much, now I'm seeing a different version. It's not as good. It does look good though, but it doesn't perform the same. Yes, Bruce Lee was very well known for falling very slowly, but he's known to run a bit faster in the versions that I'm used to. But of course, over the course of time, there has been a Bruce Lee 2 and a Bruce Lee 3, but I do have quite a lot of memories of the first game. Because you can also punch and kick your enemies, but do respawn, and also this game doesn't loop. It's not the game off with falls. Falls are basically life. You can also pick up more lives on the way by picking up yin yangs. But a really, really good game. But yes, not quite the same as the Siege of War version. It's always going to be my favourite version, being the first version I play. But we're trying to find all these lanterns, just have a bit of part in this game to open secrets. In this case, open up the trap door, which takes it into the temple. But yes, many things can kill you. But yes, falling from a height is not one of those things. We can be killed by lasers. But yes, this falling is a problem. It always has been a problem. It always will be. But enemies can also be killed by the hazards also. Which is another good thing. So pick your time wisely and make that very slow drop to freedom. The plot involves the martial artists advancing from chamber to chamber in the Wizard Tower, seeking to claim infinite wealth and a secret immortality. There are 26 chambers in the game, each one ascended by a single screen with platforms and ladders. To progress, the player must collect a certain number of lanterns, spend it at various points of the chambers. And it's also one of my favourite levels, or screens, should we say, of this game. Can kill enemies in multiple ways, but this is a good comparable way of doing it. But yes, it's good. This is not as good, but yes, your character does move a bit differently, he does fall a bit more slowly, and he attacks, and the enemies themselves don't quite move in the same way. But there's one screen, I'm very intrigued to see how it's going to be on this version. Which involves quite a lot of these. So take us further into the chambers. See, even the animation there is not the same. You jump on his head. There's no comical movements. So yes, some animations are missing. But I've noticed you do climb a little bit more faster on this one. But I'm pretty sure the falling is slower. Right, here we go, the classic screen. Of course, these feature in all three games. But yes, these are basically sparks of one cone like services. Now, depending on how many times you loop the game, this will get more and more difficult. In the C4 version, of course. But yes, your jumping is a big, big problem in this one. It wasn't really much of a problem in the C4 version. But here it is. So you couldn't jump as far. I'm pretty sure it's slower moving too. But it's not too bad. But yeah, I'm fairly happy with that. But there we go, of course, it's in colour. A little bit lighter than the Seawall version. Right, final screen. Bullets are slightly different here. 
there we go. Falls eight. I lost one life towards the end, but that's a win for Bruce Lee. And that's my first completion on the Atari 400. There you go, jump for joy. There we go, that's Bruce Lee. It's currently 10 to 2 in the morning. I know, I'm absolutely crazy. But anyway, I'm going to go up one more gear, but I might do it tomorrow, even though it technically is tomorrow. We'll try and add some more games to the 400. Anyway, a quick update on the joystick. Now, it's not the most comfortable of joysticks. It hasn't snapped yet, and hopefully it doesn't snap. But I have to admit, though, I've not used it overly much. I've been using this for the majority of the video because it's more comfortable, which is saying something because I'm not a fan of control pads. But this is more comfortable than that, if I'm honest. But it's still very early days. Right, what I need now is a USB stick. Uh, yeah. Okay, we rock and roll. I spent the last few hours putting some games on that USB stick that I found randomly in my house. But anyway, I will link in the description below of what site I use. But a word of warning, it hasn't been simple. Only certain ROMs are working. The 6200 and 5200 games, I can't get any to work. So we're going to stick with the 800s for now, which have created a file. I'm just picking a few games at random. Okay, I put a grand total of 17 games on the USB stick and only 10 of them worked. We'll start off with Orc Attack, copyright 1983 by TEV, only played it on the Amiga. Okay, so the game is Orc Attack, a fix that should have been a game written by Dean Locke and Target 8 Bit Family, published in 1983 by Thorpe EMI. The game was re released along with the Commodore 64 and Set Special Ports, when Thorpe rebanded the creator's Sparks and then later budget price by Sparklers and Top 10. In Orc Attack, the player protects a castle by dropping boulders on ladder climbing orcs. Though the visuals are low resolution, Orc Attack has high levels of violence. That's a really cool game, it's fantastic. But yes, you've got to try and protect the wall from the climbing orcs by using whatever weapons you've got in your possession, which of course are rocks and sometimes even fire. But when it comes to adding ROMs to this mini, yes, it hasn't been easy, but I have watched quite a few other videos on YouTube and some people are also saying it's not easy either. But only certain ones are working. And this is working now, but yes, when things are tough, throwing fire, it will burn them to death. But it really is a good game, but yes, only certain ones are working. 17 I've added, 10 are only working, and also 5200 and 6200 games don't work. But this is working fine, this is Orc Attack. There you go, why not? Next on the list, a bit of Cubert. Have played quite a few versions, but not this one. One or two players. Okay, so the game is Cubers, an arcade video game developed and published by North American Market by Goat Lib in 1982. It's a 2D action game with puzzle elements that uses isometric graphics. The objective of each level is to change every cube of the pyramid to target colour by making Cubers on the hazard and hop onto the cube by avoiding obstacles and avoiding hazards. And the player uses joystick to control the character. And that was also extremely difficult to read at the same time of playing it. But it's a great game, like Saracen and Baldash. The first one I played was actually a clone once again, but in this case, on the Amiga, it was a game called Cubix, which is fantastic. And so is this. But I haven't played many versions, but I have played the remake. But you've got to try and make all the colours, change the ones required to go to, which in this case is yellow, and of course, don't be killed in the process. But no time in it. Do it successfully, get points, and you move on to the next level. You get bonus 1,000 points. There you go, next one on the list, I've added it today, it works, Tapper, to survive the world needs Atari. Okay, so the game is Tapper, also known as Rookbeard Tapper, it's a 993 arcade game, read by Marvin Glass and Associates, and released by Bailey Lidway. Tapper puts the player in the shoes of a bartender, must serve eager 30 patrons before their patience expires, while collecting empty mugs and tips. It was distributed in Japan by Sega in 1984. Again, it's a classic. I've played many, many versions, but I've never played it on the arcade before. But this is also a version I've seen for the very first time. Now, it's always been baffling to me. We're actually serving beer, root beer, or Mountain Dew. If it is Mountain Dew, why is it a barrel? But anyway, the memory game. Which one was shaken, but not stirred? You've got to find it. Do it successfully, and you earn additional points from that. Do it unsuccessfully, and you end up in your face. But there we go. Round three is complete. Points of bonus warning to you, that is Tapper. There we go, why not? Go straight into the demo, this is International Karate. Did you actually realise it was on the system? Okay, so the game is International Karate, a fighting game developed and published by System 3 with Zex Spectrum in 1985 and ported to various home computers over the following years. The United States was published by Pix in 1986 as World Karate Championship. It's brilliant! I have to admit, I've only played it on the Commodore 64, and of course, yes, International Karate Plus on the C32, C4, and Amiga. This is also very, very good. I didn't realise it was on this system. I didn't realise it was going to look and sound as good as this. It's brilliant. 
But of course, it's very much like way of exploding fists. So I am white on the left, the computer is brown on the right. So of course you're trying to get more points than your opponent. Some attacks you get a half a yin yang, and some you get a full yin yang. But as long as you get more points and you do it in a time limit, you move on. But of course you can go up in belts. But it looks and plays so well. That's amazing. Great animations. We're coming at a yellow belt, 2,300 bonus. It was the first European developed game with a major hit in the United States, where it sold over 1.5 million copies. However, it drew controversy for its similarity to Departed Champ, released in 1984, which led to Data East being a lawsuit against a pit. The international Departed class successor, which expanded the gameplay, was released in 1987. Now, I don't know if it does have more additional levels, more additional stages, I'm not sure, but we're currently at green levels. I don't know. Really good! Very, very good. It's amazing. It's still going though. Kick to the nose. But yes, the controls are very much different to International Party Plus, and of course, International Party Plus had more bonus stages. And this has one also. But yeah. <laughs> Punch to the ear hole, why not? Yes, go for that. 400 points, half point for that. It's enough, we win. There you go, brilliant. There we go, we do one more game, we'll put an end to this video. I'm sure you know what it is, it's fairly obvious what it is. It's Rampage, again, a version I've never seen before. Okay, so the game is Rampage, a 1986 arcade game by Bailey Midway. Players take control of a trio of gigantic monsters, trying to survive an onslaught of military forces. Each round is completed when a particular city is completely out of the rubble. Warner Brothers currently owns the rights to the property by the purchase of Midway Games. Inspired by monster films, Rampage spawned five sequels and a film adaptation in the year 2018. Which I do have, it's okay. It wasn't as good as I was hoping it would be. But anyway, it's a good version also. It's not the greatest, it's not the worst. But it's okay. It's alright. But also, yes, I have played quite a lot of versions. It's the only version I've played, but even in one player mode, you have two characters on the screen. I am George, and the computer is playing as Lizzie. Destroy all the buildings, don't die, you can pleasure energy by picking up food all the way, and even people, of course. Blow up the car, blow up the tank, and smash the helicopter from the sky. And you move on. It's a great game though, it's superb, Rampage. Okay boys, that's more than footage, that's my unboxing for the A400 Mini, hope you enjoyed it. It's been very difficult not to try and say A500 Mini for this video. But I'm very pleased with it, very pleased I bought it, and of course, yes it has got a few things I've got to try and resolve. One of them being adding new games, but it does say on the top of the box here, compatible with thousands of Atari 400, 800, XL, XE and 5200 games. Games files must be legally obtained. But it doesn't say 2600 on here, that's interesting. Yeah. I have also bought myself a USB stick on eBay with all the games bundled in already, so hopefully that will solve a problem in the future. But until then, share with all those games. Please like and comment, you find them on most platforms, like more of the games find it fairly easily. If you want videos like this, you rest on the cheese, have a making, and live streams every Friday night, you can tell you o'clock, it's hard work. It's D. Ciao, bye, see ya. Okay, so the game is Borrowed Dash, a 2D maze puzzle game, released in 1984 by Flair... By First Star Software. Hello, Stuart Tom. Thank you very much for subscribing. Appreciate it. Thank you. As Peter the as Peter the Painter, the player uses ladders and elevators move through the colorway view of a house to paint the walls. Okay, so the game is Bristles, a video game by Fernando Herrera for the Atari 8-bit family and was published by... Hang on. <laughs> oh, Right, this is a clothes cupboard. Heart, hat, uh, gloves, hats, bow ties, money bags, batty buttons, bewitched boots, and a question mark. Well, the sequel version was published by English Software in 1984, while the Epic family was in Master Truck. Okay, so the game is Henry's House, a platform game developed by Chris Murray from the Sorry Epic family and the Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 version was. <coughs> <laughs> they killed themselves! I didn't do much on that one. It is one of the first arcade video games <clears throat> with spilt synthesis by Stern Electronics of Chicago. 
full in straight. Oh. He killed me. This is Castle Top. This is difficult. I have never got past this first level. And I've quite a few attempts as well. I don't know if it's loading or crashing. Oh. Well, that pretty much speaks for itself. It's a no-go on easy money. That is one slow-paced walk. <laughs> it really is a slow walker in this one. 